Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, and I would like to begin by thanking the authorities in Valencia for their very warm welcome. And I'd like to thank Valencia University for uh, hosting the final conference of the program of the project Sostenuto that has brought us together over the past few months. During this panel session, our main subject is to reflect on the role of culture in so far as it is a factor for renewal of European culture. So what can culture do? I would have like to speak to you in Spanish. I have to apologize because I speak in French, but that is impossible for me. So we have interpreters, and I'm sure everybody is following my uh, presentation. Anyway, to go back to this panel session, we have three panel members, and we have to talk about the renewal of the European project, and it's necessary to, nowadays Europe is experiencing a very serious crisis. Initially, it was a financial recession, a bank king crisis, and now we have sovereign debts. In other words, it, uh, we have states who are unable to pay their debt. So really, we have a monetary crisis, a financial recession. The euro is in a terrible state, and this has led to social crisis in many countries, even with uh, some countries having had to change their governments, as the Spaniards, Italians, and Greeks can witness. So there is a great deal of concern because is it the system itself that is in crisis or the pillars of European society? Or I think that we have a very serious crisis that affects um, very basic points. It's not something superficial. It's not something cultural. It's something much, much deeper than this. So in such a situation, what role can culture play? I suppose this seems a very strange question. The crisis affecting Europe nowadays is Primor primordially uh, an economic crisis, something material. It's a crisis where all we hear is about currency, deficit, budgets. We're in the world of money and culture normally is related to fine arts, to ideas more or less refined, sophisticated ideas and values. But uh, we could say perhaps that it's the spirit, the world of spirit, that is the opposite of the material world. And it will help us overcome the crisis and renew the European project. But really, this means we are placing a tremendous burden on the shoulders of culture, a great responsibility. I'm not going to go into too many details 
because we have already heard quite a lot about how culture can reinforce uh, economic dynamics. And nowadays, this is something that's very important. Cultural activities may create employment and invigorate dynamism and dynamism in uh, different regions. And so there is a wide range of possibilities. And today, this afternoon and tomorrow morning, we're going to hear some specific examples of cultural activities that have been profitable. Mr. Rafael Ripoll mentioned this just a few minutes ago. I think there is a great deal we can do, and we can obtain a good financial return from cultural activities. We'll see what's successful, what is less successful. But we'll see how culture can contribute to economic development. And we will also talk about the cultural industry, just like the tourist industry or the audiovisual industry. The results have a certain value. Culture can produce uh, financial wealth. And this situation may concern us. Culture is able to create wealth. But what type of culture? We should not forget the content of the cultural message that enables us to earn money. I'm not sure whether certain performances or certain artists are appropriate. Yes, obviously, culture can be a factor in, co in economic development, but we cannot ignore the content of the message because the message may be contrary to certain principles and any profit, any financial profit, if this goes towards a certain dangerous ideas, this could be considered something negative. And also where culture can contribute renewal and progress is something Mr. Ripoll mentioned earlier in uh, social relations. And in Europe, this is extremely important. In our, in our continent, there exist there exists some tension between people who do not share the same culture. Very often, they do not coexist in harmony. The, we're talking about problems with immigrants, social differences between the rich and the poor. The center of cities and the suburbs, so there are always some forms of tension between older people and younger people and so on. So we are living in the European Union where we have different groups, different cultures, different people living, and in order to coexist together, we have to do certain things, and culture can contribute to uh, enhancing these relations. I think that uh, today and tomorrow will enable us to hear many specific examples that show how culture can enable us to overcome a 
great deal of misunderstanding and tension. Culture has always had a role to play and I remember when I was working in the Council of Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall in Central Europe there were many tensions for historic reasons uh, because of ethnic minorities in Romania and other countries and this tension was resolved thanks to cultural activities and cultural techniques. These were known as uh, good measures and we looked at cultural events where people were able to learn about each other and how this gradually eliminated tension. I could give you many examples, but I suppose this isn't the right forum. In fact, culture plays a role that very often prevents the emergence of a violent conflict, or in the case of the Balkans, for example, once this violent conflict has emerged, culture can contribute to reconciliation between the people and to help them to heal the injuries and the harm that was caused as a result of the conflict. Here, when we talk about culture to improve social relations, there is a financial aspect. This is all very well, but we have to be very careful about the cultural message. If the message is to underline a culture as being much better or much superior to another culture, obviously that is not interesting. Uh, we have to ensure that the cultural message is uh, important. It's, it shouldn't be aggressive or imperialist or in any way arrogant or bigoted. And so I think that all of us would agree that culture can be very useful in doing away with many types of social tension in cities. Politicians recognize the tension in regions between different groups of people or within a country or within the European Union as a whole. We always have tension between certain groups or certain um, ethnic groups. I won't take up more time on this, but I'd like to talk about the third aspect where culture might contribute to innovation. And here we're not talking about economic aspects or social aspects. We're talking more about something of a political and global nature. And here I'm talking about uh, something that is not mentioned quite so frequently as the social or economic consequences of culture. This third issue uh, is more delicate because this third field nowadays is very, very important for the future of Europe. Uh, we have already said that we are in the middle of a recession. We need to make reforms in the major policies that define the European society. We have economic reform, social reform, protection of the environment, and so on. 
and I'm sure you are familiar with the Commission's do uh, document 2020. I'm sure you are familiar with the publication on the globalization era. I'm sure you have have aired the, uh, read the speeches from the president of the European Parliament and so on. We have lots of politicians telling us that we need to innovate, we need to be creative, and so on. And when we look at these texts, we realize that uh, imagination is quite modest. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about left-wing or right-wing politicians. The politicians have not been trained for innovation. Whether we like it or not, we have had a predominant thinking in other words, an idea that makes it very difficult to question the basis of the system, particularly in the case of economic thinking, which has gradually become the work of purely technical experts. Very often, Anglo-Saxon experts who are in favor of neoliberalism or capitalism or financial capitalism. And in the political class, uh, some people question these policies. I want to be very cautious because I'm speaking at the university, so I'm going to try and be careful about what I'm saying. But in these conditions, it's very difficult to come up with a truly innovative formulae. Okay, we're going to bring in reforms, but within the system, nobody questions the framework. Uh, we really never question the framework we are dealing with. And if we want to make economic reform, Economists have to study this, obviously, but also historians, uh, people who specialize in social aspects in, in the environment. And I think that the economy should be analyzed and modified and reformed on the basis of a global political project that takes into account the objectives of society. And uh, obviously, we have to take into account whether economic rules are being respected. But uh, very often, we don't judge a project from its economic policy, very often we have a very narrow perspective. And we could say that nowadays in Europe we have some excellent experts, but they are not sufficiently expert. In other words, they don't have the global vision that only culture can provide you with. So in these conditions, it's practically impossible 
to propose a European project because the technical experts are not always visionaries, they are not always capable of innovation, and nowadays Europe really needs an innovative project. In the past, the building of Europe was based on a project. The founding fathers, they had a true culture, and accordingly, their project had true value and was successful. The founding fathers in the between 1945 and 1950 made a large number of reflections and they were guided by their good sense when they launched the building of Europe culture, opened the way to them and showed them the basis on which they should establish this uh, united Europe in order to create a long-lasting peace, and this included humanistic values that can be seen in the 1950 Convention on Human Rights, and the building of Europe began with this. In other words, the confirmation of the, these values among the founding fathers and their contribution to Europe. They started with this statement, and since then, these values have been the basis that is uh, common to Europe and which prevents Europe uh, falling into the barbarian trap into which they fell in the 40s. And this declaration of values and the cultural value of this declaration is what has protected the European constitution from returning to the terrible situation that existed formerly. And why do we think that there is a threat in the case of Hungary? We perhaps because they are forgetting these cultural values. They are following a path that doesn't consolidate these democratic values. And this is extremely serious because this is an inside attack against the European values. Culture is our protection, and those who live in Spain and When we hear this phrase that was said, when I hear the word culture, I draw my gun. So if we want to have a cultural project, we need to have a project that is respectful of cultural value, respectful of the other, and that is uh, something that Europe has to reconfirm. We are now in the year 2012, and things have changed since 1945. And it's necessary for the European Union to have a global project, a political project. And it's important that this project has and uh, significant cultural facet. Nowadays, 
we are lacking this cultural dimension because it seems to have been relegated to second place. Yes, economy, Mr. Professor, uh, as you said, you were right, economy has invaded the landscape, making the market and its objectives uh, part of the European Union. And I agree with this, although it may seem somewhat exaggerated, but the form of thinking in Europe is exclusively materialistic. I don't want to underrate the need to meet certain material needs of people during this time of crisis. I agree we have to reduce unemployment, but when I say that Ma Europe has become materialistic, it's because it's their only aim, their only objective, and then everything else is secondary. So in these conditions, we shouldn't be surprised that the European project seems uh, somewhat technocratic, cold, heartless, and soulless to the ordinary man in the street, uh, particularly during times of crisis, because during a uh, crisis, people need to uh, find some warmth, and this cannot be found in economy. And accordingly, to invigorate the European project, we need to find the correct place, the appropriate place for culture. And we're also talking about past culture because Europe has a huge cultural baggage. And this includes creativity, innovation, imagination, all of which are necessary to build the future Europe. And we can build the future Europe based on the past. Once we have assimilated the past, and once we have improved the past in order to build the future, this includes creativity, particularly cultural cre creativity. And we see that official documents, I mentioned the document 2020, but these documents are, fall short of what is necessary to innovate. We are always talking about the uh, knowledge economy, but what lies behind this knowledge? We have the impression that we're talking about precise technical knowledge that is immediately usable, but what about historic philosophical, philosophical uh, content or knowledge? Or when we look at the chapter on uh, knowledge economy, we need to learn the language. We need to be able to use uh, computers and other media. And the new generation needs to be able to manage a team, to be able to do accounting and so on. But is that enough? Well, no, it's not enough. In a rapidly changing world, it's not sufficient to change one piece of equipment for another piece of equipment that's more uh, advanced or uh, provides better performance. We need to have a critical perspective. We need to be able to imagine other basic concepts, different equipments, 
because we are living in a world where technologies and science are evolving very quickly, uh, but they are evolving in a world where individuals are very often lacking in creativity in, uh, and really uh, changes remain very superficial. So through a living, demanding culture, we can enable society to move forward. And without being revolutionary, I am convinced of this. More than ever, I believe that Europe requires a global society project and a political project, but in the most noble sense of politics. And in this project, we need to have a broad and deep cultural base that is enriched with different proposals, uh, quality basis. And Europe needs this for Europe. Other people are aware of this need here. We live in the Mediterranean. In the South Mediterranean, we have seen uprisings and revolutions, and we have seen how countries, after many years' silence and passivity, have began to move. But in what direction are they moving? We still don't know. And as I said, they need to have a very strong cultural base, uh, particularly countries like Egypt, Libya, Tunisia. So I will conclude with an anecdote that I think helps us to think about the importance of culture in modern society. This anecdote took place in Berlin a few months ago in a bilateral meeting between leaders from China and leaders from the European Union. I didn't attend this meeting. Uh, they told me about it. And at the beginning of the meeting, the president of the commission made his classic speech. They talked about trade exchange, the problems with the uh, Chinese currency, and so on. Everything that, that all the different uh, points they usually deal with in a meeting of this nature. And then the Chinese side started talking. I don't know if it was the president or the prime minister. And he started talking about Goethe. Kant, Voltaire, and so on. And people were astounded. And they said, oh, he's not only quoting these great philosophers, but he's, why is he saying that they represent our wealth? Well, this can be interpreted in two ways. We have the negative interpretation that China, the Chinese come towards the Europe, and the, he basically uh, is criticizing these great philosophers. But there's another interpretation, and that's that the Chinese are aware of their economic power, and they could have spoken about their civilization and said there are two civilizations in the world that are worthwhile, the Chinese and the European civilization. So basically, if he had placed himself on this level, he was recognizing 
the culture in Europe. The Chinese are very intelligent, and I think at that meeting they gave us a very good lesson, and Europeans need to listen to this lesson. So I'm going to give the floor now to the other members of the panel. Mr. Alin Nika. I'll give the floor to Mr. Alin Nika.